Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm going to be reacting to Dr. Ben Doolittle in a conversation with Sadhguru at Yale School of Medicine. So this has been a request. I've been putting it off just a little bit because it's a, an hour and about 45 minutes long. So I'm assuming it's going to be talking about medicine. Not too sure, but let's go ahead and give this video a shot. Sadhguru, welcome to Yale. Thank you. <laughs> what a delight, what a joy uh, to have you here. You are among friends, and um. it seems <laughs> that there are many who uh, know of your work, uh, and there are many who, who, who don't. You are a highly educated man, and I'm, but I'm devoid of education, so you have to... <laughs> well, uh, you know, as Make some allowances for me. Uh, that's lovely of you to say. I, I'm so well educated, I have rediscovered a joyful curiosity. And, uh, and while it is true I have many degrees after my name, as I've lost my hair and become more <laughs> wrinkly, uh, I've, I've so enjoyed uh, the sort of spirit of, of, of joyful curiosity. So, in the spirit of hospitality, in the spirit of, of, of joyful curiosity and coming together across traditions, I would love to hear your thoughts on a number of topics. The one that is near and dear to my heart as an educator and as a physician and a pastor is this area of, of, of wellness and burnout. Physicians today a big study came out, 54% of physicians in America uh, meet criteria for burnout. And nurses are in the same boat, and you're here at a medical school, and uh, we're looking for answers, and we're looking for hope. And so to those 54% of physicians who are burned out, and the nurses, and PAs, and nurse practitioners, all of us in healthcare, what would you, uh, what would you say to that? Hmm. I did hear something like that. And I mean, it kind of makes sense when you're just doing the same thing over and over again. I know most people who get into their jobs that they like, you know, they, they really enjoy it at first for the, f maybe in the first few years, but after a while it just becomes redundant, unappreciated. They just put up with a whole bunch of stuff, and I think that's the case. It's just the fact that it's they're 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 really enjoying it at first, and then they saw the reality of it, which is unappreciated work for the most part, um, redundancy or sorry, uh, I guess you could say kind of like redundancy, where they're just doing the same thing over and over and over again. Nothing really changes. A few you know excitements here and there. But, I wonder, I am curious. If, I mean, I'm sure when they first started doing their job, they really enjoyed it. But, again, just redundant stuff or just doing the same thing over and over every day and being unappreciated, I, I'm guessing so it really burns them out. If we have to bring health either to ourselves or to others, one fundamental thing is you bring a very profound sense of wholeness into you, the various dimensions of life that we are. All of it is in sync and functioning well. It's sad to hear that physicians are in a state of burnout. How would they cause health? They could sell more medicine, but they cannot cause health if they are in a state of burnout. Now we're seeing, as modern medicine progresses, comes out with miracle after miracle, research, all kinds of things. But people are not getting healthy. More people are getting sick than ever before. <laughs> That's because we're lazy, we don't take care of our health, we can't afford healthy food, we don't exercise. 
<clears throat> and everyone wants shortcuts. And with technology and everything nowadays, everything is instant, you know, except for the fact that, you know, whenever there's a Google ad, you can't skip it for at least for five seconds. <laughs> but for the most part, most people are busy doing their work, busy doing something else, and they don't have time for their health, so they want quick fixes. And generally speaking, that's what you want. they want quick fixes for everything, too. A country like the United States, which is uh, the most affluent country on the planet, which essentially means you have a choice of nourishments. You do. Every human being has a choice of nourishment. But if it's not quick, most of the ailment that you see in other parts of the world are nourishment related in some way because the needed nourishment is not there at the right time for a whole lot of people on this planet. But in a country where there is a choice of nourishment, I would say an excessive choice of nourishment, the nation is spending three trillion dollars on health care. This is bigger than the budgets of major nations in the world. India's economy is, up, under, is around three trillion dollars. You're spending that much on health care of a quarter million people. This shows somewhere we have missed health. Maybe we have an industry going, but we have missed health. Well, we can explain it in so many ways, but doctors being under burnout, everybody thinks their profession is the most difficult one. If… if any individual human being is creating something that they really care for, there would be never any kind of burnout. I will say, I think most doctors and nurses genuinely, when they first started out, really wanted to help people. Now, mind you, I guess there is a… Maybe some people really deeply believe in that, that maybe they never get burnt out, but most people generally want to, or most people who get in this field want to help people. And I think it's just the underappreciation, the repetitive nature of their job, maybe the strain, the, the, how do I say, the work constraints kind of all builds up into this burnout. But I think, I have a feeling Sadhguru is going to say something that even with all that, they will still not get burned out. I think it's being passionate, really, 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 really passionate about your job. Because I'm trying to think of a way, I mean, I don't know, you know, you take vacation, but when you come back, you're going to be like, ah, oh, I got to go back to work. Kind of like me too. <laughs> I have to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> it's like, ah. Oh. Well, I mean, my job ain't that bad, though. Myself and a whole lot of people around me, we are seven days of the week, twenty hours a day, three hundred sixty-five days. This is our schedule. Twenty hours, jeez. You will not see me burned out. Maybe sometimes I'll get physically exhausted. Maybe I'll die of exhaustion one day. But definitely not of burnout or boredom. Those two things will never happen to me. Why I'm saying this is, the fundamental reason why this is happening is, particularly the physicians, because there are various kinds of professions. But particularly when people go to your doctor, in some way they're placing their life in his hands. So when somebody is willing to place their life in your hands, you must treat it as a sacred duty. It's not just a job, it's not just a business. It is… A, when somebody is willing to place their life in your hands, I'm telling you, even people who live with you, your own wife and children or husband is not willing to place their life in your hands completely. But somebody, an unknown person comes and places his life in your hands, I think it's the greatest privilege that somebody trusts you at that level, that they're willing to trust you with life. You could do right things or wrong things. 
Well, sometimes people don't really have an option too, where, you know, I have to do this. You're the only person here and I need this done now. But I get what he's saying, absolutely. I mean, yeah, <laughs> even if you're the only person there, he is still trusting you with his life though, you know, I get it. <laughs> knowingly or unknowingly? Because nobody has figured the human body absolutely, all right? We know it to some extent. So you may do any number of wrong things, but they place their life into your hands. I think traditionally it was said like this in India. In any given society, if education, medicine and spiritual process, if it gets commercialized, that society will go down the drain. I think we are doing this to the entire modern world, all three are becoming commercialized. There is nothing wrong with commerce. Commerce is a, a transaction of give and take. You give me this, I'll give you that. But there are some things which cannot be handled as just give and take. If you bring this aspect of transaction into spiritual process, into education and into medicine, then it turns ugly and that ugliness will definitely burn you out one way or the other. Above all, what people are experiencing is burnout is, first of all, they're doing something that they don't care for. If they were genuinely doing something that they truly care for, there would be no burnout. The more opportunity you get to do it, the better it would be, isn't it? I will say yes, if, if, uh, if you're doing something you don't really care for, you're going to get burned out a lot quicker. And that's why I said, like, if you genuinely, truly, 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 truly love what you do or love or really want to do it, you won't necessarily get burnt out. But still, you know, you, so there are some people will still get burned out even though they, they love what they do, they love helping people, but just because of the, the again, the, uh, the stress of the job, the restriction of the job, or the things you have to do for your job instead of just taking care of people. That can get you burnt out. The politics and jobs or the regulations and rules of the job. And instead of you just doing the job, you know, you have to do a whole bunch of stuff. Like, for example, I, I did work in a hospital once and, you know, they have nurse, then they have the nurse assistant. And the nurse just generally sits in their, in their computer, like typing a whole bunch of, um, was it paperwork? And while the nurse assistant goes to the rooms and they have to do paperwork, but they check on every patient while the nurse is sitting there doing the patients. Like, and basically they just sit there do paperwork all day until there's like a real emergency where they're needed. It's just, it's, <laughs> it can get, you know, you're just like, oh, this is not what I signed up for. I signed up to help people. I'm sitting here doing paperwork. And it's become a, bu a bureaucracy kind of in a lot of the jobs where you have to, do paperwork, 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 but it's it's a way to cover your butt, it's a way to cover the business, it's a way to cover whatever, but it just ends up being in the way as well. Everything is towards a certain end. The joy of doing what you're doing is not there in one's life. This is not just for any one profession, it's for all professions, mm -hmm. but particularly in a profession like this, where it's a question of life and death for somebody else. When it's a question of life and death for the person who is sitting in front of you, it can't be a transaction for you. Well, there is a business end to everything because to make anything sustainable, there has to be a business end to it. We are not against the business end of it, but within yourself, if you don't do it as a great offering to the person who is sitting in front of you, of course they will pay their fee, but within yourself, if you are not like this, definitely you will burn out doing this. I knew he was going to answer that question. <laughs> I, but it's obviously, like I, like I said, and he's just saying here, it's like if you genuinely believe in your job, you're not going to get burnt out. But I, I, again, I, I can understand there are some people who do, and it's just the bureaucracy of the job. ...kind of work. Otherwise, every day, if you help a person, if in some way you made somebody's life, their life better, by the end of the day, should you be ballooned into a joyful state or should be in a state of burnout at the end of the day? <laughs> it should not be a burnout. If you genuinely experienced, you have enhanced many lives around you, this is not about service, this is not about ideas of I served this, I did this, no. 
there is a joy within a human being when they're able to touch another life. Uh -huh. Why you are holding a few people dear to you as family is because you believe you can touch their life in some way. You can make a difference. That is what is most important for a human being. In every activity that we perform, whatever the nature of the activity, how profoundly we can touch someone else, this is what makes the big difference. If you make a movie, you don't want to make a movie which nobody wants to watch, would you? You want people to watch this movie and come to tears, isn't it? Or joy or excitement. You don't want to build a house that nobody wants to live in. You don't want to cook something that nobody wants to eat. These things you can do only because in some way you are able to touch another life through your activity. This is most mm. fundamental need within the human being. And as a physician, you have a phenomenal opportunity of touching lives like very other… F very few other professions can do. And this should not lead to burnout but this is happening so because we are trying to treat it like a transaction and the most fundamental thing that we have not understood in this process is that human experience is caused from within, not from outside. Your joy and misery, your pain and pleasure, your agony and ecstasy, even light and darkness right now is happening only within you. It never happens around you. What happens within you? If you try to fix it by fixing what is around you, you will go bonkers in no time. I'm surprised why only fifty-four percent <laughs> Because if you don't understand human experience is caused from within, especially medical professionals who in some way have delved into the nature of human physiology and I believe to some extent the mind. I think only fifty-four percent because I believe most of those people probably work in like they don't own their own professions. They work in hospitals, which deals with a lot of paperwork. Again, I, I think I think most of them, if they didn't have to necessarily deal with the bureaucracy of the medical field, I think most. I think that number would be much lower. And I think maybe the forty-eight percent is majority going to be people who own their professions, who are family doctors, who deal with their um, patients. Uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> who own their own business, who doesn't have to deal with too much bureaucracy, and who deal with people on a one-to-one -one basis and basically who owns their own physician or their own place not working for a hospital I think most of those people are the 48% while there are still some I'm sure that work in the hospital and still enjoy their, uh, enjoy their jobs. We must know that every aspect of human experience comes from within and today modern medicine especially unlike the traditional medicine is entirely chemical fixes for everything. So you understand that both health and illness is happening because of chemistry. Joy and misery is a certain chemistry, different types of chemistry. Ecstasy and agony are different types of chemistry. Or in other words, we are a chemical soup. <laughs> the question is only, are you a great soup or a lousy soup? Now if I give soup making ingredients to all of you, do you believe all of you will come with the same kind of soup? Nope, different kinds. It depends on how you cook the soup, what ingredients you add first and foremost, and how much of those ingredients you add. This could be very salty or very peppery, <laughs> and I am familiar with both. Hmm? You will come with hundred different varieties of soups. So there is something called as the skill of soup making. All of us have come with the same fundamental ingredients of life, see in how many ways we have become and only fifty-four percent are getting burnt out. Handling life so wrong, hundred percent should be burnt out. So let's talk about making soup <laughs> <laughs> So… Do, no, don't go into this area, I'm a very good cook. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk… Uh, so, the soup of life, if you will. Um, so, you know, uh, tonight there is a nurse or a physician who has come home and they told a family member that their loved one just died. Or they treated a child uh, who's undergoing chemotherapy. 
or they were in a clinic where they're taking care of someone who you know, doesn't have enough insurance to cover that medication. And so those good folks have come home and their spirits are broken. And, uh, and they love what they do. I, 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 I think burned out physicians love what they do. Mm -hmm. They do. Uh, and I like that metaphor of soup. What can we do? Uh, and so, what, what can we do? And I don't know if he's gonna, <clears throat> sorry, I gotta reposition my legs. <laughs> um, so, I think, I think here people need to real, uh, well, I'm acting like I know everything. <laughs> no, but I mean, this is, I've thought about this a little bit. And I think what people don't realize, the people who work in this field, the people who help people and see these things, I'm sure these people, if you are generally kind and you care about your patients, I think these people are happy to have had you in their life, you, no matter how short that is or whatever, that if it weren't for you, they would be feeling terrible. Like there are some people, I would say like uh, St. Jude's Hospital, they handle a whole bunch of children and even though some of them don't make it I'm sure they're grateful for seeing someone that cares about them and shows care to them to show what humanity can be just because they have passed away and there was nothing you can do does it mean you didn't affect their lives in some way Again, just showing them some kindness, showing them that you care, makes a huge difference to that person. So no matter if their life turned out not in the best way, but because that person was there showing them some kindness, they have had a better life than I think they could have had. So I think if a lot of physicians, nurses, people who work in the medical field, and people who just work with people in general, and who have this thought in their mind that, uh, you know, I've seen too many people die, I can't do this anymore, I tried so hard. I think if they realize that sometimes they are the last people they see in life and showing them that kind of, showing them that you care, it's actually a very good thing. The last thing they see is you being kind and caring to them, that is significantly better than seeing nothing at all. Or seeing anything else, honestly. So I hope they come to realize that. I'm sure if they did, I'm I'm sure some of them actually. I'm sure a lot of them did actually. As a matter of fact, I, I I'm, I'm sure I heard that somewhere, and that's the reason why I thought of that. Is the fact that you know you know they don't have very very long to live, but I'm glad I was there until the very last day to ease their pain, the transition. <laughs> what can that? nurse, that physician assistant, that doc, what? Saturday morning comes around. They wake up. What should they do? I, I can teach you a way of making your chemistry into a blissful chemistry. That means you're blissful by your own nature, not because of something that happened around you. This is exactly what I'm saying. What this question implies is, what happens around you determines what happens within you. The significance of being human is this, that what happens within me, I can create around me. Saying that, again, this, is, this has been said before around, it's the fact that when you bring this positive energy, other people can see that and they also get that positive energy from you. I try to always stay positive. <laughs> if what happens around me, makes me, I'm still in animal nature. Oh, yeah, yeah. A human being means, I do all the same things that the animal does, but I can do all of it consciously. That is the big part of being human. Well, you are born like any other creature, you grow up, you eat, you sleep, maybe you reproduce and you die one day. This is what every creature does, this is what you and me do, <laughs> but we can do it consciously which includes your thought, your emotion, everything. To put this very simply, 
It amazes me that people are twenty, thirty, fifty, sixty years of age, they still do not know how to handle their thought and how to handle their emotion. Me this too. is a huge disability in the world. Me too <laughs> If you don't know how to use your hands, would you call that a disability? Mm. If you don't know how to manage your thought, how to manage your emotion, is it not a disability? Just because everybody is in the same condition, it does not become normal. <laughs> so well, I wouldn't call it as ability, but it is uh, the lack of control. If you have the ability to use your hand but don't know how to use it, I don't think it's called a disability. That's a, that's, disability means you like your hand's cut off and you don't know how to use it. Well, that, that you know, hand cut off part, that's all that needs to be a disability. You, you can't use that hand, obviously. But if you're able to use the hand but you just don't know how to pick up stuff, you can learn how to pick up stuff still. So I don't think that's called a disability, but I get what he's saying, I get what he's saying. So essentially, you are, you have made a choice of dealing with people who are sick or dying. It is a choice and it is a privilege that those who are unwell, being unwell means you are no more hundred percent on your feet. You need somebody's help, such people and those who are dying in some way, they're willing to trust you and put their life into your hands, it's a great privilege. Well, in this there are many things to do as you gave examples that you have to convey something unpleasant to somebody. Sometimes you're not able to treat them because either you have no time or they have no money or whatever, these are there, I'm not questioning this. But. The most important aspect of this is, if you want to bring well-being to somebody, you <coughs> must know how to be well, isn't it? Otherwise, how would you do it, I'm asking? How it's kind of like saying, you know, if you want to help other people but you can't help yourself, so how are you supposed to help other people? If you are a drug addict yourself, how can you get someone else not to be a drug addict, drug addict when you are a drug addict? <laughs> exactly, wonderfully, yeah, exactly. You have to be... I think, I will say this and I'll move on, uh, if you were a drug addict and then you quit it, you have I think a better understanding on how a drug addict thinks and how to help them out of it versus someone who was never a drug addict though. How, how would you br create well-being to someone when you do not know how to be well? What this implies is, if I have to be well, the world has to be perfect, well, you're not going to be well. <laughs> because even if you're just two people in the family, not everything happens the way you think it should happen, isn't it? Hello? You can tell me, it's okay <laughs> Even if you're just two people, not everything will ever happen to you hundred percent the way you want it. Fifty-one percent, if it's happening your way, you have the controlling stake. Anything more if you expect, you'll have a divorce <laughs> Yes <laughs> So, outside will never happen hundred percent the way you want it. And I wish a lot of people will understand that because a lot of people just don't. They expect everything to go their way and if it doesn't go their way, they blame other people. Or in other words, if you expect the outside to be hundred percent the way you want it, you're just not equipped to live here in this world. Yes or no? If you're expecting the ex external situations to go hundred percent my way, obviously I'm not equipped to live in this world. You know, we are a volunteer organization, over four thousand full-time volunteers, over three million part-time volunteers, Every day somebody is coming up to me and says, Sadhguru, I can't take her anymore, I can't take it. This person, I can't work with this person. This man is like this, this woman is like that. I tell them, see, this is the kind of people that exist in the world. If you think what you're doing is very significant, 
you got to work with these people, however they are. If you want to work with ideal people, you must go to heaven and today <laughs> <laughs> These are our realities. If you truly see, genuinely see that what I am doing is significant, it's of significant, it's significant enough to make difference in lives around me, now you have to do that work. The problem is not of the nature of your work. What the heck happened there? <laughs> okay. You just ask anybody, from the topmost job down to the most menial job, everybody complains about stress. So stress is not about your job. I must tell you this, a few years ago, many years ago, when I first came to United States, wherever I went, people were talking about stress management. I couldn't understand this because <laughs> in my understanding, we manage whatever is precious to us, our family, our wealth, our business, our money. Why would anybody want to manage stress <laughs> It took me a while to understand, people have concluded that stress is a part of their life. Stress is not a part of your life, it's just your inability to manage your own thought, your own emotion, your own energies and your own body. If you knew, if your mind took instructions from you, would you live in stress or in bliss? Please tell me. What's your choice? Sure. Yes, such a simple thing is not happening because your mind is not even taking instructions from you. If your intelligence turns against you, who the hell can save you? <laughs> so, this anxiety, this stress is not about the job, it is just that our education systems are such, they're telling you how to conquer the world, you know, how to break an invisible atom, how to go beyond space, but they're not telling you a thing about this one. This is the most complex, if you want to call it a human mechanism, this is the most complex and sophisticated me mechanism you have seen, yes? Yes. As a doctor, you know, <laughs> but I'm asking, even the doctors, have they read the user's manual? <laughs> How to use this? No? Just by accident, something. When you live by accident, anxiety is natural. <laughs> so, I was really interested in the title of your book, Inner Engineering, <laughs> A Yogi's guide to joy and uh, those are some words that you don't usually see often so close together i'm thinking about engineering and joy and joy <laughs> and, and a know, yogi there are some, and a yogi <laughs> and a yogi right engineering yogi you know and i and i like that word engineering i you need to know there are some really uh, some of the top engineers at the university are in the audience tonight. Yesterday was the engineers… Right there, right there. Yesterday was the World Engineers Day. Yeah. So, what's the… what's the theme of… what's the… what would you say is the message of this? I mean, I think you're getting at that. Inner engineering, <laughs> a yogi's guide to joy. What… what does that mean? If I were to answer that question, I would say it's a way to understand your emotions, your needs. I think that's it. Emotions and needs. You have your basic needs, food, water, shelter. Then your emotions, which you need, which he kind of explained already, which is you must have control over your emotions because you don't have control over the world therefore you should not let the world influence how you feel otherwise you know he's saying about the perfect world therefore you can be happy but that's going to be impossible so you need to make yourself happy regardless of what's going on around the world uh say uh, if you if you and me were here let's say a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago how the world was and how it is today, it is almost another world.
It's not the same world, you wouldn't have recognized it. That's how much it has changed. What changed this? Our ability to engineer external situations the way we want it. We could sit outside and do this, but now we're sitting in this building because this is engineered for our comfort. Now, engineering essentially means making something just the way we want it. We made everything in the world the way we want it, but now fifty-four percent burnout <laughs> Because we did not make this one thing the way we want it. If we made this one thing the way we want it, again the same question, would you live blissfully or miserably? Blissfully. If you made this the way you want it, you would definitely make this blissful, highest level of pleasantness for yourself. What you want for your neighbor may be debatable, <laughs> but what you want for yourself is very clear, isn't it? So, this is not happening because we have never approached inner well-being in a scientific manner. We are thinking something else from somewhere is going to fix this. <laughs> if we want to be well, we looked up. In India, they call this Uparwala, that means the one above. I'm saying, is it true that you are living on a round planet? Hello? Is it a round planet that we are living on? And on top of it, it's spinning. If you look up, you're invariably looking up in the wrong direction, isn't it? <laughs> You must go to Australia <laughs> to look up the right way <laughs> hmm. So I'm saying we are simply even incapable of knowing what is up and down in this universe. Is it somewhere marked in this cosmos, this side up <laughs> We not only do not know, we cannot know, isn't it? So we don't even know which is up, which is down. We do not know what is forward, what is backward. We really do not know what is east, what is west. For convenience, we made up things. Relative to whatever, we can say what is north and south, east and west, but that's just relative to something. But yes, I get what it's saying. But there it's is one thing that you can know right now, there is a perspective. There is inward and there is outward. We have been just busy fixing the outside. You fix the outside as much as you want, all you will get is comfort and convenience. You will not get well-being. If well-being has to happen, you have to engineer your interiority the way you want it. Only when this becomes the way you want, now this will be joyful. If outside becomes the way I want, there will be comfort. You have to admit this, never before in the history of humanity, any other generation knew the kind of comforts and convenience that you and me are enjoying right now, yes or no? Huh? We are the most comfortable generation ever, but we are whining like crazy <laughs> Let's… let's talk about… All right, just because I have a feeling it might run long, I gotta pause it right here because the last video uploaded hasn't done, got done processing, it's been a few days. I have to try to cut these things short and I'm absolutely loving this so far. So far everything I've heard of that uh, I've of previous Sadhguru videos. Now I can't wait to get into further into what else he has to say. So the next one's going to be inner life and outer life. Inner life and outer life. The outer life you can't control. Inner life is you have absolute control of. That's all I'll say so far. Well, anyways, that's the first part of this of Dr. Ben Doolittle in a conversation with Sadhguru at Yale University, Yale School of Medicine, sorry, not university. If you like my content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.